a dense forest park where terrifying monsters roam, an abandoned prison whose halls play host to ghostly convicts serving time from beyond the grave, and a blood-soaked battleground where the restless spirits of soldiers lost in conflict still linger await on this list of some of the most haunted places in Pennsylvania. Are you ready to get started? Hey guys, and thanks for joining me in exploring some of the most haunted places in the Keystone State of Pennsylvania. Recognized for its ties to the very founding of American independence, for its breathtaking nature expanses, abandoned town sites, aged cemeteries, and more, Pennsylvania also hosts its fair share of disturbing local legends, ghost stories, and tales of the unknown. Let's jump right in. Our first haunt lands us in central Pennsylvania at the awe-inspiring Bucktail State Park. The Bucktail State Park Natural Area, which is located within Cameron and Clinton counties in Pennsylvania, is a sweeping 16,433-acre expanse toting a range of dense and lush forests, rivers, ponds, lakes, and more, that derives its moniker from the Pennsylvania Bucktails Regiment through the Civil War, and its bounds are tied to a range of supernatural activity and tales of mysterious encounters. Historically, predating European settlement, tribes native to this region would utilize what was known as the Cinnamahoning Path to cross the Eastern Continental Divide and Allegheny Front between the Saskahanna and Allegheny Rivers. Later, pioneers and settlers would travel this very same route and would dub it the Bucktail Trail. And later still, the old native path would be paved and officiated as Pennsylvania Route 120, which was in turn, in 1933, designated as Bucktail State Park. Over its many years, this park has welcomed development in a slew of additions and continues to act as a popular nature expanse into the present, offering a mess of trails, swimming, kayaking, and canoeing opportunities, campsites, options in angling and hunting, and more. But beneath this deceptively serene expanse lies a web of old hill stories and tales of paranormal encounters, and those who frequent its bounds have reported disembodied voices and laughter heard throughout the trees, extreme cold spots felt through the heat of summer, and the sounds of phantom footsteps that seemingly stalk lone walkers. A multitude of cryptid encounters have been documented by both officials and visitors within park bounds, and include run-ins with Sasquatch, Sheepmen, Squonk, which are pretty much pig people who are always crying and that leave behind trails of their tears, and with Clinton County's own local monster, the Gawagal, which is essentially a six-foot-tall bipedal wolf with bird talons for hands and hooves for feet that was created by witches of centuries past in order to punish those who'd offended their their covens. Lastly, and most famously, across Bucktail are tales of full-bodied apparitions or ghoulish beings sighted walking through campsites after dark. And on nearby roadways, it's incredibly common for motorists to pick up hitchhikers that linger for moments before vanishing mid-drive. Okay, so our second haunt takes us to Pennsylvania's second largest city, to the Cathedral of Learning. The Cathedral of Learning, which is located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, is a massive 42-story skyscraper serving as centerpiece to the University of Pittsburgh's main Oakland neighborhood campus that boasts the title of being the tallest educational building in the whole of the Western Hemisphere, and its bounds are tied to a range of campus legends and good old-fashioned ghost stories. Historically, in 1921, one John Gabbert Bowman would be honored as the 10th Chancellor of the aforementioned University of Pittsburgh, after which he would express his desire to create a tall building to act as a dramatic and functional center of education to the city, all while alleviating overcrowding issues that were previously faced. After which, by November of the same year, the university would acquire a $2.5 million plot and would begin the planning of our future Cathedral of Learning. When construction was started in 1926, the site would boast the title of being the tallest building in the city, and by 1937, the construct was officially dedicated. 
In July of 1940, and at the start of World War II, a bomb threat was made against the structure, resulting in the dispatching of various guards and officials to the cathedral, and through the remainder of the war, the site would be utilized to house, feed, and instruct around 1,000 Army Air Corps members, as well as dozens of Army engineers, a purpose it would serve until 1945, after which it would return to its intended use and has served as such ever since. More recently, in 1975, the site was added to the National Register of Historic Places, and today continues to serve the university, offering a wide range of educational services including various classrooms, computer labs, a theater, a cafeteria, convention and event space, and much, much more. Chillingly, the Cathedral of Learning has long been shrouded in tales of otherworldly activity, and both faculty and students to its bounds have reported extreme cold spots felt throughout the building, instances of objects sighted moving around on their own, and encounters with shadowy figures. Several informal investigations of the site have yielded high EMF levels and orbs captured in photography and video, while the Krogan Shinley Ballroom is rumored to harbor the spirit of its namesake, being Mary Shinley, who's been known to appear to those who venture about alone. Also reported throughout the building are disembodied footsteps and voices heard emanating from empty spaces, instances of doors or windows opening and closing on their own, and accounts of electronics behaving erratically, or of batteries and personal devices dying at abnormal rates. Easily the most famous haunted hotspot within the cathedral is that of the early American room, where a host of activity believed to be tied to its various artifacts has been experienced. A more prominent story tells of one Martha Jane Poe McDaniel, whose beloved quilts were donated to adorn this space. It's believed that various ghosts, as well as the spirit of Martha herself, are tied to these creations, and some have reported run-ins with her full-bodied entity, or instances in which they turn for only a moment to find the quilts suddenly look as if they've been slept in. Our third haunt lands us on the opposite end of the state, in Pennsylvania's largest city, at the Eastern State Penitentiary. Eastern State Penn, which is located out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, is a former lockup turned museum that, during its time of operation, was recognized as a particularly brutal place for one to serve time, and that now totes an impressive assortment of local legends and chilling ghost stories. Historically, construction of this formidable site, which was designed by John Haviland, would begin in 1822, and what was initially called Cherry Hill State Prison due to its seating on a chunk of farmland recognized as such, would open its doors on October 25th of 1829 as what many consider the first true penitentiary on Earth. Notably, its first means of rehabilitation implemented what was known as a separate or Pennsylvania system, which consisted of prisoners being confined to their own individual spaces, in the warden literally visiting every prisoner at least once a day, and in various overseers visiting inmates three times a day. Additionally, the prison cells were actually pretty advanced for their era, and all boasted faucets with running water over flushing toilets, as well as curved pipes to heat quarters through the winter months. While prisoners at Eastern State were afforded some luxuries current inmates at modern penitentiaries aren't even allowed, such as community gardens, plentiful free time, and the ability to keep and raise pets, they were conversely required to do all of these things alone, and would even be transferred between areas with hoods over their heads and in total solitude from fellow inmates. Through the remainder of the 19th century, Eastern State would grow rapidly and overcrowding would creep in, threatening the site's former way of life, and by 1913, solitary confinement would become unmanageable. As a fun bit of trivia, in 1924, Governor Gifford Pinchot would sentence Pep the cat-murdering dog to a life sentence at Eastern State for allegedly murdering his wife's cherished cat. Along with a mugshot, Pep was actually assigned an inmate number, though newspaper articles of the time have since revealed that the governor actually just donated his own dog to the pen in order to keep the inmate morale up. On April 3rd of 1945, a major escape was carried out by 12 inmates, including the infamous Willie Sutton, who, over the course of a year, actually dug a 97-foot tunnel under the prison wall. And while this story was sensationalized, in truth, over 30 additional incomplete tunnels were also discovered over time. In 1965, the site was declared a National Historic Landmark. In 1971, prison operations were shut down and inmates were transferred to more modern facilities. And following the lockup's eventual abandonment and through the 80s, a forest would actually grow in the cell blocks and across its grounds. 
More recently, in 1994, Eastern State was open to the public for tours, and to date, offers a range of educational materials and visiting opportunities, including several options in ghost tours, and rightfully so, as both staff and guests have reported a host of inexplicable phenomena experienced across the premises, including disembodied voices and footsteps that emanate from empty spaces, extreme cold spots felt in adverse weather, and instances of objects, doors, and windows moving or opening and closing on their own. Activity on site has actually grown in infamy such to the point that it's attracted a range of paranormal investigations, including some that are fairly high profile, such as those performed by the Ghost Adventures team, and results have yielded high EMF fluctuations, chilling EVPs, hits on thermal grids, and seemingly sentient responses on communicative devices such as Ouija boards or spirit boxes, while others have told of the constant feelings of being watched or being followed by someone or something unseen, or of encounters with ominous shadowy figures that appear suddenly to startle all present. Some have told of instances of cell doors slamming and of encounters with full-bodied apparitions of both guards as well as the rather creepy manifestations of former inmates, donning isolation hoods with eye holes cut into them, while others have told of instances of personal effects going missing and being found later in odd places deep within the facility. Easily the most famous Eastern State Penn tale tells of the notorious gangster Al Capone and his time there. Chillingly, during his brief stint at this lockup, the hardened criminal would swear he'd encountered one James Clark within his cell on numerous occasions after dark. Disturbingly, Clark had been killed under Capone's orders at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, and many believe his restless soul was seeking some form of recompense or vengeance. And on to number four, which has us exploring the creepy ex-community of Centralia. Centralia, Pennsylvania, which is located in Columbia County, is an iconic borough and near ghost town often associated to the setting of the popular video game series Silent Hill, whose once booming population took a massive dive in the shadow of an unbelievable disaster, and its vacant grounds are believed to play home to ghosts, cryptids, and the otherworldly. Historically, lands now holding Centralia were initially owned by tribes native to the region, including the Susquehannock. In 1749, said tribes would sell off lands to colonial agents for 500 pounds, and in 1770, through the construction of the Reading Road, which ran from Fort Augusta to Reading, settlers would survey and explore parts of the future town site. In 1793, one Robert Morris, who was a Revolutionary War hero and one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, would acquire a third of what would comprise Centralia's Valley before, in 1798, declaring bankruptcy and surrendering said lands, which were quickly purchased up by a French sea captain, one Stephen Gerard, who had heard tale of anthracite coal across the landscape. Mining of the area would begin much later in 1856 with the creation of the Locust Run Mine and Coal Ridge Mine, followed by the Hazeldell Colliery Mine in 1860, the Centralia Mine in 1862, and the Continental Mine in 1863, and by 1865, the Lehigh and Mahoney Railroad would run track right to the budding Centralia, which at this point was a booming mining town. By 1866, Centralia was incorporated as a borough. However, it was quickly wrought with tragedy when, in 1868, the town's founder, Alexander Ray, was actually murdered in his buggy by members of Molly Maguire's. And eventually, by 1878, three men were tried and hanged for this crime. By 1890, Centralia boasted a population of around 2,700. The Wall Street crash of 1929 would result in five local Lehigh Valley coal mining operations being shut down, though bootleg mining would still continue afterwards. And in 1950, the Centralia Council would acquire rights to all anthracite coal beneath its bounds, after which coal mining would continue up through the early 1960s. Now, here's where things get interesting. On May 29th of 1962, firefighters would set Centralia's local dump on fire in order to make space as they had done so many times in the past. However, this particular fire wasn't fully extinguished, and the blaze would spread from the surface down into abandoned coal mines that ran like spiderwebs beneath the budding township. The result? A massive underground fire that would go unnoticed for over a decade. In 1979, locals would become 
aware that the very earth beneath their feet was burning when Mayor and gas station owner John Coddington inserted a dipstick into his underground tanks and, upon withdrawing it, found it hot to the touch. And later, in 1981, and like something straight out of Silent Hill itself, a 12-year-old boy named Todd Domboski was actually almost killed when he fell into a sudden four-foot sinkhole that literally opened up beneath his feet and was pulled out just in time before a vent of hot and noxious carbon monoxide-filled steam was emitted. By 1983, Congress had allocated funds for relocation efforts. Over subsequent years, nearly the entire town's populace had vacated, and by 1990, census records would show only 63 residents remaining. More recently, by 2002, Centralia's postal service was ceased. By 2006, only 16 homes remained scattered across the once booming town. And by 2009, Governor Ed Rindle would begin a formal eviction of the remaining residents. In the present, very few homes and ruins remain scattered throughout Centralia, along with its old church. And its landscape is marred with random splits and holes that are testament to the fire that, as of the release of this video being 2024, is still and and has been burning for over 60 years. Surprising exactly no one, long-standing Pennsylvanian legend claims the whole of Centralia is haunted by various entities, ranging from native spirits disturbed by the town's construction, up through miners who perished in accidents, and more recently, by the restless souls of locals who were forced to move from their homes and who later perished elsewhere. And those brave enough to explore the old town site have reported extreme cold patches felt in adverse weather, shadowy forms sighted slinking through overgrown forests, and encounters with phantom automobiles of the past that appear suddenly to chase the living before fading away. To the south of Centralia lies a stretch of Route 61, which today boasts massive cracks, holes, and fissures that have seemingly opened up from the very hell that lies below them. And around this stretch, many have told of instances of extreme dizziness or anxiety, of demonic voices heard on the winds, and of run-ins with ghastly abominations that crawl from the depths to chase any near before returning to their fiery origins. At the church, some have told of cultish-looking silhouettes clad in cloaks and hoods that are spied near after dark, and others claim to have discovered ritual sites around or even inside of the structure that appear to be satanic in nature, while a handful of accounts have described pale, ghoulish figures that lumber through encompassing foliage, seemingly watching the living from a distance. Intriguingly, for such a small township, Centralia boasts a total of four separate cemeteries that aren't exactly small in size, and each are said to host more than just bodies, with those who have tread their grounds reporting disembodied voices and music, odd scratching and knocking sounds from beneath the earth, and encounters with apparitions and clothing spanning the eras that have been known to communicate with the living at great lengths before fading away. Lastly, near where Centralia's downtown used to lie, some have recounted experiencing visions of the past, in which they blink and find themselves surrounded by life and images of the community's heyday for moments, before blinking again to find the landscape has returned to its normal cold, vacant, and overgrown state. Saving the best for last, our fifth and final haunt lands us where else than at the site of the most violent confrontation of the Civil War, being the Gettysburg Battlefield. The Gettysburg Battlefield, which is placed in none other than Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, is a historic expanse preserving the site of what is easily considered the bloodiest conflict of the Civil War, and one that ultimately killed any hopes the Confederacy had at establishing an independent nation that today is recognized as not just one of the most haunted places in the state or country, but in the world. Historically, in 1863, amidst the Civil War and following his failed invasion of the North, being the Maryland Campaign, Confederate General Robert E. Lee would decide to launch a second invasion, one that would allow his troops to live off of local farm bounties while threatening Philly, Baltimore, and Washington, and strengthening the growing peace movement in the North. On June 3rd, Lee's army would move north from Fredericksburg, Virginia. By June 15th, the Army of Northern Virginia would begin crossing the Potomac. And by June 26th, elements of Confederate Major General Jubal Early's Division of Ewell's Corps had occupied Gettysburg after chasing off its emergency militia. By June 29th, Lee had ordered his forces to concentrate near Cashtown, which was around eight miles from Gettysburg, and to avoid engagement until the entire Confederate army had arrived. On June 30th, one Confederate division headed by Brigadier General J. Johnston Pettigrew would venture towards Gettysburg, and upon his approach, would spot Union cavalry under Major General John Buford arriving just south of town. 
Despite Lee's orders, when Buford reported this sighting to his superiors, Generals Hill and Heth, who believed this cavalry was simply Pennsylvania militia, the men decided to mount reconnaissance in force the following morning. And at around 5 a.m. on July 1st, two Confederate brigades would advance on Gettysburg, thus initiating the now infamous battle. For a total of three days, from July 1st through 3rd, around 70,000 Confederate and 100,000 Union soldiers would clash in brutal confrontation. The result? A resounding Union victory and an effective end to the Confederacy, with the former claiming approximately 23,000 casualties and the latter around 28,000. Later the same year, interest in the preservation of the battlefield would surface, and on November 19th, President Lincoln would deliver his famous Gettysburg Address at the dedication of the Soldiers' National Cemetery. In 1895, the battlefield would be recognized as a park and memorial. Through the early 1900s and Great Depression era, it would welcome a slew of projects under the Civil Works Administration and Civilian Conservation Corps, and through the golden age of capitalism, namely through the 1950s, various commercial facilities were developed locally. In 1967, the National Park Service would purchase various parts of Gettysburg, including its National Museum. Over subsequent years, it would also acquire various park landmarks. And in 1974, the Gettysburg National Tower was completed, though it would later be demolished. More recently, in 2007, forests around the Devil's Den area were removed. In 2008, the National Museum was demolished. In 2010, the Comfort Station was raised. And in 2013, the Cyclorama Building and Visitor Center was destroyed. Gettysburg National Military Park remains open into the present, pulling in around 3 million annual visitors while offering a wide range of educational materials, events, reenactments, tours, and more. All throughout Gettysburg, destruction resulting from the war is still very visible to this day, in the form of bullet holes in trees, ruined structures, and various decayed remains. Even its grounds are technically soaked in blood, and long-standing ghost stories and Old Hill legends claim that restless spirits from combat linger. With both officials and visitors reporting phantom cannon and musket fire heard on the winds, disembodied shouts and cries of battle, and the clash of small arms heard from somewhere just out of sight, the full-bodied apparitions of both Union and Confederate soldiers and cavalry have been sighted in numerous locations, namely around Little Round Top, the Peach Orchard, and the Wheat Field, while in the appropriate titled Valley of Death, full-scale scenes of battle have been viewed by unsuspecting visitors, who believe these visions reenactments until they promptly fade into nothingness. Several informal investigations of the expanse have yielded high EMF levels, chilling EVPs, and orbs both captured in photography and visible to the naked eye. While near the area called Triangular Field, dozens have reported odd malfunctions with personal electronics, instances of phones or cameras dying, and of strange whiffs of fog that float through the locale with seeming sentience. Easily one of the most infamous paranormal hotspots across Gettysburg is that of the aforementioned Devil's Den, which hosted some of the conflict's most vicious combat. Interestingly enough, reports of activity experienced across Devil's Den began only days following the conflict and have continued ever since, with those exploring the area reporting the smells of spent powder and tobacco smoke, encounters with various ghostly soldiers and cavalrymen, and run-ins with an odd specter in unkempt clothing with long hair, a floppy-brimmed hat, and bare feet, who has held full-scale conversations with the living, and who some believe was a civilian or bystander killed when he got too close to the battlefield. Across the whole of Gettysburg, reports entail encounters with a mysterious lady in white that drifts around after dark, and that seems to glow under the moonlight, while a phantom regiment of Confederate soldiers in tattered remains has been known to march various areas, fading in and out of reality. In the Farnsworth House Inn, both staff and guests have reported disembodied breathing, grunts, voices, and music, the strong scent of cigars, and spectral silhouettes captured in the background of photography. While at the Dobbin House, which was actually a lodging through the war and a stop on the Underground Railroad, both the spirits of its former owner being Alexander Dobbin and those of slaves on the run have been sighted, seemingly going about tasks from their lives long since past. The Carmichael Orphanage, which was used as a place to house the wounded and dead during the battle, and later as a place to house children who had lost their fathers in the war, is shrouded in a particularly disturbing legacy. 
As it's told, one headmistress, Rosa J. Carmichael, was harsh and abusive towards the children she was entrusted with, and supposedly chained and tortured a handful of them in a makeshift dungeon before she was ran out of town. Chillingly, those who have visited the site have reported the sounds of children heard screaming and crying, the phantom rattle of chains that are no longer there, and the small apparitions of those whose lives were stolen within. Lastly, at an area known as the Grove, which lies right next to East Cemetery Hill, and that during the battle hosted a violent exchange between two regiments of Ohio regulars and Louisiana Tigers. A number of remains and mass graves have been discovered, while the ghosts of both soldiers and of a little girl who it's believed took her own life due to post-battle stress have been sighted. And at the legendary Saks Covered Bridge, the spirits of three Confederate deserters who were hanged there have been viewed swinging from their necks and writhing in eternal agony. An endless testament to the brutality of the era where brother fought against brother for the rights of our very nation. Thanks for joining me in exploring some of the most haunted places in Pennsylvania. If you enjoyed hearing my histories and ghost stories, subscribe to my channel, throw this upload a like, and share me with anyone you feel could use a good scare. I'll catch you all next time.